All right, how are we today? Um, let's see, today is the 25th. So is Emily here? Hi, Emily. How are you? Do you have news for us today, or did you already do news? Um, I haven't done it for this last yet. Okay. Um, Sorry, I didn't know. Did you, did you did you find one for today? Yeah, I turned it down. Let's do it. Um, here it is. Okay. And should be way right We can't see it, but all the all of the uh, zoom buttons are getting in my way. So I can't see. It's on here. All right. Um, what do you got for us? Um, this is just an article from the New York Times, basically talking about how uh, central bankers, bankers are uh, raising interest rates soon and talking about what the Ukraine invasion means for the raising of interest rates and how it, as of right now, probably won't have an effect on it, but it depends on what. It depends what? It depends on. It's just basically talking about what the Ukraine invasion has in store for the raising of the interest rates in the Federal Reserve Board. Okay, so will the Fed respond to these activities in Russia, right? And Ukraine? And how? Uh, and, and what? What do they think? What does this reporter think? She was basically saying that as of right now, they're not planning on changing anything, but it depends on like the raising of the wages and prices and everything going on right now, and what like Russia invading Ukraine can cause, like. Obviously, raising of prices here too. So, how much of a crisis, and what is the mechanism for the the stuff that's going on in Russia and Ukraine? How would that affect our economy here? Well, um, and, and everybody can participate. Yeah. Well, like, didn't their stock market like crash like almost a third overnight? Who? Uh, the Russian one after like the sweeping economic sanctions went through. Okay, so so that affects Russia's economy. How does that affect us? Uh, it stopped international investment. Okay, so Americans who might have wanted to invest in Russia now can't. Yeah. Okay, are they going to stop wanting to invest? No. So where are they going to invest instead? Maybe here. Should that boost American economic growth? Maybe. Although for the investor, if they had preferred to invest in America to begin with, they would have. So they must have been expecting a higher rate of return from whatever investment opportunity they perceived to be in Russia at the time. So instead, they didn't foreclose upon the opportunity. I saw a hand in the back. Oh, um, I was wondering if maybe like it could impact the American economy because we rely on Russian oil. Okay, do we rely on the oil from Russia? Um, not, not as much. Not a lot, but oil, Russia is a major producer of oil, right? U.S. oil imports. So it's not as much with Russia. Yeah, but like. Where does the U.S. get most of its oil? Majority from Canada. Oh. <laughs> With you know 136 million barrels, which is over 50% of all imports, Russia had 17 million barrels. So an order of magnitude less than Canada, but it's involved. Yeah. Right. Um oh, this is not the kind of thing I wanted to do, but um do yeah, that was awful. Shocking. Um, 
So here, here's an interesting report. As of late 2021, the U.S. was importing 8.5 million barrels per day of crude oil from all countries. Canada was our top supplier. Um, here we have historically Venezuela had been a supplier even greater than Saudi Arabia back in 1973. Interesting. Let's see if I have enough extra pages to see this one. So, I'm like, for water, four feet, four feet. Is there a good chart here? No. Do better, internet. And providing the data that I want. U.S. importing at five from all countries. Canada was our top supplier, sending about four. Doesn't say how much the U.S. is producing itself here. Mexico was number two, and then Russia. Saudi Arabia is our fourth largest supplier. Um, so Russia supplied seven percent of crude imports in twenty twenty one. Uh, but one of the one of the ways Russia was doing that was by undercutting prices, right? They're keeping prices low. Why are they keeping prices low? Because they want to buy gas. And so they sell oil cheap, get more money, right? And and, and they use that to buy guns or, or have other opportunities. Okay. Do, 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 do. Well, thank you, Brand News. Let's see here. Give you your points. Um, how many of you went to the talk last night? Yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll create a, a Canvas assignment. That um, you don't have to answer a quick question, so I think it's easy for me to grade. And then I'll get the list of people who actually went from Missy and I'll compare the two and then delete your card. Okay, good. Um, what else do we have going on? Uh, we've got a midterm next week on Friday. Is everybody going to be here for that? Some people have to travel, yes. I already talked to you. You okay. already talked yeah. to me, and I'm going to give you the exam on Monday? Yeah. Are you on swim team? Yeah. Okay. That means I got to write the exam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I found out. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, we'll see what I can do about that. Just make it a really easy one. A really easy one? Yeah, give us a practice. Okay. <laughs> I would like to, but. But yeah, <laughs> Okay, um, let's work out this problem here. From chapter eight, end of chapter. And stop me if there's something confusing or something. All right. All right, so we have uh, an economy described by this production function y equals f of k comma l equals k to the 0.4 l to the 0 0.6. What should we do with this? The question says, what is the per worker production function? What's the first step there then? All right, we're going to first find the per worker, so we're going to divide everything by l. L being the number of workers that we have in society. So if we divide everything by L, we get Y over L equals F, the function of K comma L divided by L equals what? K to the 0 0.4 over L to the 0 0.4. Now that step might be confusing, but do you understand why? I know you can't see me. Okay. And I, I'm asking you to just walk along with me. Okay. And occasionally I'll switch to my own page. Oh, I, we can even read the problem. Okay. I can 
Can you read this? I can't. <laughs> Sorry, I need a new description. I can read I got a square. It's the per what is the per worker production function? And so far, all we have is this equation. Maybe I can make it bigger. Oh, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> Okay. So, so the first step is k to the point four over l to the point four, or just simply k over l to the zero point four. And how would we want to rewrite that? Well, we redefine y over l to be little y, and we redefine k over l to be little k. And we rewrite the equation as little y equals little f uh, of k is equal to k to the point four. And I'll switch to this. So far, so good. Second part of the question asks, it says, assuming no population growth or technological progress, I wonder if I could just do this. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, hilarious. Okay. Uh, that's easier. Assuming no population growth or technological progress, Find the steady state capital stock per worker, output per worker, consumption per worker as a function of the savings and depreciation rates. Okay, so this is just going to be algebra. We're going to just do this algebraically. Okay, and we want to find the steady state capital for worker. Well, we have to remember that. The, the change in capital is equal to the savings rate times the output function minus the rate of depreciation times the quantity of capital. And at the steady state, the change in capital is zero. zero. It's no longer changing. It's arrived at the steady state. So then S of S times F of K equals delta K. Okay. Or we can get all the K's on one side. You can get all the K's on one side. Right. And we'll put the we'll, we'll try to put the, uh, the function in the denominator. Right. Once we've achieved the steady state, by the way, we can put little asterisks on the Ks to indicate that um, that we're in the steady state. Okay, and we could divide both sides by F of K star and divide both sides by delta this D thing, and we end up with I'll move every I'll move the case to the left hand side. So end up with k star over f of k star equals s over del. Now in this example, we have an expression for f of k. So we plug that in for the denominator here, and we say that um, k star, right, over k star to the 0 0.4, because that's what we do when we plug it into the function, is equal to s over delta. Okay, so k star to the one, basically over k star to the zero to the point four is equal to k star to the point six, and that's equal to s over del. So to get just k star, 
we will take the reciprocal of to the point six. And that's six tenths, which is three fifths. So we'll multiply this to the five thirds. And we have an expression for the set steady state and relationship to and and what the steady state would be given a certain savings rate and what a certain de depreciation rate would be. What would output be? If this is the expression for K star, what's the expression for output? And what's the expression for output when capital is at its steady state? Well, we know that output is equal to K to the point four. Which is the same as to the two thirds. A two fifths, rather. Two fifths. So if we take this result for K star and plug it in here, we get Y star equals S over D to the five thirds to the two fifths, which resolves to S over D to the two thirds. Are you following my algebra? Almost. All right, at that, at that level of capital and that level of output, what's consumption? Per worker. And we're writing this all out directly as a as a function of saving and depreciation rates. But we know that consumption is equal to one minus s times output. If you think about our function, here's our output function, here's our savings function. How much do we consume? The difference between output and savings. Right? So uh, so consumption is equal to one minus the savings rate. The savings is expressed as a percentage of output times the total level of output. So given that we know that this is the level of output, can we express consumption as a relationship between savings and depreciation? Yes, we take the steady state level of consumption would be equal to one minus the savings rate times the steady state level of output. So the steady state level of consumption would be one minus the savings rate times the savings rate over the rate of depreciation raised to the two thirds taken from here. Now we have an expression for consumption, also just in terms of the savings rate and the depreciation rate. So then the next part of the problem says, assume that the depreciation rate is 15% a year. Make a table showing the steady state, capital per worker, output per worker, consumption per worker, for savings rates of 0, 10, 20, 30%, and so on. That sounds like a lot of work. You could use a spreadsheet. What savings rate maximizes output per worker? So you would want to set this up in Excel and you want to have columns for the savings rate, the steady state level of capital, the steady state level of output, the steady state level of consumption, and you might even want to know the marginal productivity of capital minus the depreciation rate. And we're going to take as given rate the, the depreciation rate of, of 0.15. So we can maybe put that here as well. Well, this is going to be constant. Right. Depreciation is equal to 0.15. If the depreciation rate is 0.15, 
then we might make a bunch of different assumptions about the savings rate. We could say, okay, what if the savings rate is zero? What if the savings rate is 10%? What if the savings rate is 20%? What if the savings rate is 30%? And so on. We could, we could use an equation in Excel to put in this cell right here to solve, and then we just drag and drop, right, to get the rest of the answers. What equation would I want to use there? This one. So I would say that this is equal to, right? Um, let's call this A, B, C, D, E. Let's call this one, two, three, four, five. So I say this is equal to um, on this expression. So I'm going to have open parentheses B2 divided by the assumption for the depreciation rate is 0 0.15, 0 0.15, carrot, parentheses, five thirds. Does that make sense? Okay, and then I would drag and drop that down. Similarly, for, um, for, for output, my equation for output is s over d to the two thirds. So I would say this is so I would say this is equal to d two over zero point one five raised to the two thirds. Consumption is this equation. So I want to fit that in there somehow. I'd say well that's equal to open parentheses one minus B2, open parentheses, B2 over 0.15 raised to the two thirds. I want to make sure that the two thirds, only this part of this term is being raised to the power. And I'll come back to this in a minute. And then I can drag each of these down to the results. And these are the results. What do these results tell us? As the savings rate goes up, what happens to total capital? As the savings rate goes up, capital goes up. As the savings rate goes up, what happens to output? Apple also, uh, output also goes up. As the savings rate goes up, what happens to consumption? Consumption goes up for a while, but it maxes out right here. Doesn't it? Okay. What is this marginal propensity or productivity of capital minus delta talking about? We drew this the other day. Marginal productivity of capital is where are we along this curve? As we increase our quantity of capital, what happens to output? What is the marginal productivity of capital? It is the first derivative of my output graph with respect to capital and again, the effect of capital. And where is it maximized? We said this the other day as well. Where the depreciation, the slope of the depreciation line is equal to the marginal productivity of capital. You can't see me or it or anything. Yeah. Okay, so 
the, the marginal productivity of capital is the slope of this line along this curve. And we say that marginal that consumption is maximized at the point where the marginal productivity of capital is equal to the rate of depreciation, which is also indicated on this table, right? By identifying that the difference between the marginal productivity of capital and the rate of depreciation is zero at the point where consumption is maximized. <laughs> Does that make sense to you? Okay. Right. So that's kind of the, the, the outcome of chapter eight, the ideas that we're working with in chapter eight. We'll work through at least one of those problems to see with some numbers to see if that helped you develop any intuition. Uh, jumping into um, then some of the material from chapter nine, we go beyond. Merely considering uh, changes in the capital and changes in the savings rate and changes in uh, the rate of depreciation and changes in the population. But now we also want to include changes in technology. So the questions that we ask are, should we save more or less? And based upon what kind of principles? The, the policy that we have that the government can try to influence is, just the savings rates. However, there's, there's a problem, and that is that we don't know what to invest in. Now, individual entrepreneurs have some ideas about where to invest, and they're risking their own money. Does the government know where we should invest? Does it seem to know? Does it behave like it knows? And what would you look at to see if that were true? So if the government wants to encourage investment in a particular industry, what will it do? Yes. Subsidize it. It'll subsidize that industry. That's right. Okay. If the government is subsidizing a particular industry, what must the market think about that industry? Yeah, it's probably not worth investing in, <laughs> right? If the government is subsidizing it, then private investors must not be. So private investors must think about it's not a good thing to invest in. Now we've got a problem though, because some some goods are public goods, right? So if a good is a public good, then the private investor's benefit is less than the public's benefit. How does that work? What do I mean by that? Yeah. Like an individual wouldn't want to invest in a subway system, but if a subway system is built, it's going to benefit everybody. It's a great example. Thank you. Okay. So public goods are those goods that it's really hard to um, to exclude some people from consuming, like the fireworks, right? On the 4th of July. You got fireworks on the 4th of July, everybody's helped to pay for them right? and they all get to enjoy it. And the people even who don't pay to get into the show can see the really big ones, that's why really high. 
Do you all think that fireworks will someday be replaced with drones? Have you seen any of these drone shows where the drones move around? They, they got like a thousand drones flying and synchronously uh, in the sky and then they all make different shapes and they continuously light stuff up. Kind of cool. I don't know if they're bright enough. I don't know if they're less expensive than fireworks. They're reusable, right? Like Elon Musk's new spaceship, right? I don't know. Be interesting to see. So the things that we could invest in, they're heterogeneous. It's not just investing in GDP, it's, it's investing in a variety of different things. We might be interested in the institutions that are, that are impacting markets. Uh, these are the rules that have to be followed by banks and government. We might be interested in culture. And, and that's part of what Dr. Otteson was getting at last night in terms of honorable business. It has something to do with culture. Um, another policy lever that this analysis doesn't really capture very much it is to change technology, to encourage technology. Okay. You can also try to impact and the, the population growth. What is the average population growth rate? Right now, it's it's getting close to zero or negative in the United States. We're, we're not having very much population growth. What do you guys think about population growth for the for the future? Some of you had me for intro macro. What what do people say about population expectations for population growth into the future? How many people are alive right now? Seven billion, some people. Yeah, something like seven billion, right? Okay. Will population continue to grow? Some people believe that population, you know, has been growing in an exponential manner, like this. But it seems like when the people of a country become wealthy enough, they have fewer children. I may have talked a little bit about why that's the case in the past, but one reason is that, well, less people want to stay home with the kids. And when that becomes the case, why, why might somebody not want to stay home with the kids? Well, because they can earn more by not staying home. So when incomes, particularly incomes for women, go up, women have to children. children. This is true for middle class households. Once you get to really high level income households, some of them start to have more kids again because they can afford to. Um, but, but in general, we're starting to observe a trend that population growth will actually get some sort of an inflection point and then level out. And this has already happened in places like Europe and Japan. We're in a rapidly aging population. And so amongst other times, Rosling estimates that population will plateau around 12 billion. Is this good, bad, or what? Some reasons why this might be a good thing. Yeah. Environment. Okay, so let's get back on the environment. Good. Other reasons why this, this might be a good thing. Fewer mouths to feed, right? So, so we don't have to grow as much food. We don't have to move as many people around. Okay. Why might this be a bad thing? Yeah, less workers. Fewer workers, right? Okay, so, so less stuff. So that could hurt our quality of life, perhaps. However, if productivity per worker continues to increase, which is kind of the thing that's causing a decrease in, in population growth, then fewer workers won't impact our quality of life very much. It may actually it, be consistent with the higher quality of life. The higher quality of life might be causing there to be fewer workers. Right? However, if the population gets really old, then they might lose workers faster than, uh, than productivity is increasing. 
So that's interesting. If, if n is going, the change in n is decreasing while um, the change in total factor pro productivity, right, is going up, that can balance out at some point. This could actually become negative at some point. Okay, so these are all interesting things to think about. Um, I think it's a real challenge. I think it's a challenge because the question becomes, well, why should anybody have kids? Okay. Kind of a pain in the butt. A lot of extra work. Personally, I love my kids and thoroughly enjoy them. But why should anybody want to have kids? Uh, this becomes an even bigger problem for religious people. Uh, religious groups might ask themselves, well, why should we have any more kids? If having kids is actually a, a negative on that for, for the world, maybe it's sinful to have more kids. It seems to be contrary to us religious traditions, though. It's interesting. I mean, it's interesting. Okay. We want to bring technology into our analysis of economic growth. And so the way, it's, the way Matthew does this is he says, look, output, we've talked about it as being some sort of a function of capital and labor. We want to augment that labor. We want to increase the efficiency of labor. Okay. And so we're going to do that. Um, by improving knowledge and technology and the health of the worker. So what kinds of tools are, are people using? Not just having more tools, but better tools. And the way that thank you makes this in, you could do it by augmenting capital directly, but instead he does it by augmenting labor. It says we have some factor that increases the efficiency of labor. Now, if it's actually increasing the efficiency of labor, what can we say about E? It has to be greater than one. Okay. I have this E term be greater than one because it's causing an increase to L. Does that make sense? Okay. So L times E is described as the effective number of workers. So a more productive person is a more effective worker. Okay. So in this case, a change in the efficiency of labor functions similarly, similarly to a change in labor, the quantity of labor. Right? In other words, we're holding capital consistent, capital isn't really being affected by this. And since we're not influencing capital, this is going to affect our, our solo model, not through the output curve, but instead through this line, which has been depreciation plus population growth. Now we're going to add a G term here, and that is related to this E term, efficiency of labor. So we call G the rate of labor augmenting technological progress. So this paired term L times E grows at rate N plus G. All right, in other words, uh, delta E over E <laughs> equals G. That's the rate of growth in labor efficiency. Yes. So you can be like 
point eight in the circumstance of like a constraint on labor where they can't work at full capacity? I like that. Sure. So if if something happens in the economy that causes the efficiency of labor to decrease mm -hmm. for some reason, so that workers can't work at full efficiency, then yeah, he would be less than one. Okay. In that case. Cool. Thank you. If he is less than one, then what's G? Negative. Negative. Okay. Can you to continue to build this before we have K equals K over L? Now, little K is equal to K over L times P. And little Y is going to be equal to Y over L times P. So how are we going to express this in functional form? We're going to say that Y equals F of little K, same as before. But what is affected is, well, how does the quantity of capital change, the quantity of effective capital change? And we're going to say that similar to before is the savings rate times the output function minus, right? And before we had this delta in this n term, now we're going to add the g term in there as well, all times little k. Okay. So delta times K means how much we're replacing the capital. N times K means you have, you have to be more workers, more capital. And G means having actually better capital, better capital that better augments labor. If we have this assumption, we can rearrange it and say that big Y is equal to little y, rearranging this, big y is equal to little y times times e times l. How would we read this? Total output grows as output per worker plus the growth rate plus the population growth plus technological growth grow. All those are captured in the last sort of equation. And when we graph it, very good graph, yeah. <laughs> now, what's interesting about all this is that That in this model, we talked about how policy can cause the savings rate to change, but there is a an optimal savings rate, right? We find the optimal savings rate we just described as where these two are the same, so we find the optimal savings rate right here, so that we find the golden rule level of output or level of capital to maximize consumption. We don't think that we can affect population very much, although sometimes we try. Right? We try to have policies that increase or encourage population growth or decrease population growth. And so, have I already told you about the European mother-in-law situation? Right? In some Nordic countries where people are not having very many children, Middle-aged women are sad because they want grandchildren. Okay, remember, children are intermediate goods. The only reason we have children is so that we can have grandchildren. Okay. You're not important. <laughs> okay, so so what are these middle-aged women in in Nordic countries doing? They are paying for their sons and daughters-in-laws or their daughters and son-in-laws to go on very romantic vacations. Like they're setting them up on these beautiful, long, glorious, romantic vacations and, and encouraging them to make grandchildren, right? 
because they want grandchildren. It's one way to subsidize population growth. They haven't been very effective. Turns out that there's potential obstacles. Um, okay, then what about growth? Is growth something that can be affected through policy decision? A lot of things potentially affect growth. The rate of technological progress can in part be a function of investment in research and development. Where do good ideas come from? Uh, sometimes good ideas are purely serendipitous. So then you just have a brilliant idea. But having a brilliant idea doesn't mean that it exists in the world. You have to go and make the thing. So having the brilliant idea is less than half of the story. Developing the idea and actually bringing it to market is the rest of the story. You can have a brilliant idea that uh, is technologically impossible. Brilliant idea, but the tech isn't there yet. We can have cold fusion production of energy. The technology isn't there yet. Okay. Have a brilliant idea the tech is available. You can have a brilliant idea, but it's not economically feasible. Maybe you know how to do cold fusion, but the cost of actually doing it is way, way, way more expensive than just using fossil fuels. Then it's economically unfeasible. So just having a good idea is only half the problem. You've got to bring that idea to market. How do you know whether your idea is a really good idea? You can't know until you do bring it to market. So there is a lot of R&D that happens that goes nowhere. And having an idea is really serendipitous. It's like getting struck by lightning. Okay. However, there is a way to increase the probability of getting hit by lightning. You can go outside and hold a golf club in the air during thunderstorms. Put yourself into a five iron frenzy. Zzz. There is a mid 90s Christian ska band named Five Iron Frenzy. Yes, I do know them personally. See you guys on Monday.